Greetings, and welcome to the AMD First Quarter Financial Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. If anyone wants to require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ruth Cotter, Senior Vice President, Worldwide Market, Human Resources, and Investor Relations. Ruth, please go ahead. Thank you and welcome to AMD's first quarter 2020 financial results conference call. By now you should have had the opportunity to review a copy of our earnings release and slides. If you have not reviewed these documents, they can be found on the investor relations page of AMD's website, amd.com. Participants on today's call are Dr. Lisa Su, our President and Chief Executive Officer, and Devinder Kumar, our Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Treasurer. This is a live call and will be replayed via webcast on our website. Before we begin today, please note that our annual shareholder meeting will be held on Thursday, the 7th of May, as a virtual event accessible from amd.com. We will also be attending several virtual Wall Street events during the second quarter, including the Bernstein Strategic Decisions Conference on Thursday, May 28th. And our second quarter 2020 quiet time is expected to begin at the close of business on Friday, the 12th of June. Today's discussions contain forward-looking statements based on the environment as we currently see it. Those statements are based on current beliefs, assumptions, and expectations, speak only as of the current date, and as such involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our current expectations. We will refer primarily to non-GAAP financial metrics during this call, except for revenue and segment operational results, which are on a GAAP basis. The non-GAAP financial measures referenced are reconciled to their most directly comparable GAAP financial measures in today's press release posted on amd.com. Please refer to the cautionary statement in our press release for more information on risks related to any forward-looking statements that we may make. You will also find detailed discussions about our risk factors in our filings with the SEC, and in particular, AMD's annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 28, 2019. Now, with that, I'd like to hand the call over to Lisa. Lisa? Thank you, Ruth, and good afternoon to all those listening in today. Before covering our quarterly results, I wanted to provide some comments addressing our response to COVID-19. First, I want to recognize the toll the pandemic has taken on the world. The breadth and speed at which COVID-19 has changed the world since our last earnings call has been staggering. I want to thank the countless healthcare professionals and essential workers serving on the front lines every day. At AMD, our first priority has been to protect the health and safety of our employees. We have transitioned the vast majority of our more than 12,000 employees worldwide to working from home while ensuring we maintain focus on reliably supplying our customers with the products and services their businesses depend on. We are also supporting the communities we call home through financial and personal protective equipment donations and providing our technology to accelerate medical research. More than ever, the pandemic has placed technology at the forefront of how we work, learn, shop, and connect. And we are proud to be providing many of the components powering these essential technologies. Against that backdrop, we performed well in the first quarter. Revenue increased 40% year over year to 1.79 billion as demand for 7 nanometer Ryzen, Radeon, and Epic processors drove record first quarter revenue and our highest gross margin in eight years. I'm pleased with our execution in the quarter as we quickly adapted our global operations to navigate pockets of supply chain disruption and addressed geographic and market demand shifts caused by COVID-19. Turning to our computing and graphics segment, first quarter segment revenue increased 73% year over year to 1.44 billion, driven by increased Ryzen and Radeon processor adoption. We saw some softness based on the COVID-19 situation in China that impacted PC-related sales in the first quarter. While both component and system demand were relatively strong at online vendors, 
Offline channel sales were weaker than expected as many retail locations across China were closed for much of the quarter. PC demand in the rest of the world was strong, offsetting the softness in China. Client processor revenue grew significantly year over year, as strong rise in processor demand resulted in significant double-digit percentage increases in unit shipments and ASP. As a result, we believed we gained client unit market share for the 10th straight quarter. In desktop, overall demand for our latest Ryzen 3000 and prior generation Ryzen 2000 processor families was strong, both of which continue to top retailer bestseller lists and have more than 50% share of premium processor sales at many top global e-tailers. In mobile, unit shipments increased by a strong double-digit percentage year over year. We set a record for quarterly notebook processor revenue driven by sustained demand for our previous generation offerings and the ramp of the first Ryzen Mobile 4000 design wins. Initial consumer notebooks featuring our new Ryzen 4000 processors launched to strong demand based on reviews that demonstrated their performance and battery life leadership for ultra-thin and gaming notebooks. We also gained momentum in the commercial market, winning multiple large-scale deployments as Lenovo announced new ThinkPads and HP launched commercial class ProBooks powered by our latest Ryzen 4000 mobile processors. We are on track to accelerate our mobile growth this year as Acer, Asus, Dell, HP, Lenovo, and other OEMs are expected to launch more than 135 new Ryzen-powered consumer and commercial notebooks over the coming quarters. In graphics, first quarter unit shipments and revenue both grew by a double-digit percentage year over year, driven largely by sales of our Radeon RX 5000 series desktop and notebook GPUs. Desktop channel sales increased based on solid demand for both 7 nanometer RDNA graphics cards and previous generation Radeon RX 500 series GPUs. In mobile, demand for notebooks powered by our Radeon 5000M mobile GPUs, including the latest Apple MacBook Pro and other gaming notebooks, drove a richer mix as customers transitioned their platforms to our new RDNA mobile offerings. Development of our RDNA 2 GPUs continues to progress well. We are on track to launch our next generation gaming GPUs later this year with a 50% performance per watt increase compared to our current offerings. In the data center, Microsoft introduced new virtual machines optimized for visualization workloads powered by our Radeon Instinct MI25 GPUs. Microsoft is using our differentiated virtualization technology to partition a GPU for the first time in the same way they partition multi-core CPUs, allowing customers to tailor the GPU capability to meet the needs of their specific workload. Turning to our enterprise embedded and semi-custom segment, revenue of $348 million decreased 21% year-over-year as lower semi-custom revenue more than offset a significant increase in server revenue. As expected, semi-custom product revenue was negligible in the quarter, as Sony and Microsoft both reduced inventory in advance of next-generation console launches. We expect semi-custom revenue to increase in the second quarter and be heavily weighted towards the second half of the year as we ramp production to support the holiday launches of the new PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X consoles. In server, unit shipments grew by a double-digit percentage sequentially and more than tripled year over year as we continue gaining momentum across cloud, enterprise, and HPC customers. We saw particular strength with cloud providers introducing new instances and accelerating current deployments. Microsoft Azure, Google, and IBM all announced new offerings powered by second-generation Epic processors, highlighted by Google launching multiple general-purpose VMs and Microsoft rolling out an all-AMD virtual desktop offering that also includes Radeon Instinct GPUs. Several cloud providers accelerated their infrastructure deployments to address rising demand from the growing number of users working and schooling from home. 
For instance, one of our large cloud customers was able to deploy 10,000 second-gen Epic servers in less than 10 days to support the surge in demand for their collaboration services. In the enterprise, we expanded our second-gen Epic processor portfolio with new high-frequency processors that expand our performance leadership to advanced modeling, database, and hyperconverged workloads. With these new offerings, our second-gen Epic processor family now includes both the highest performance per core and performance per socket processors in the industry. We continue winning in HPC, highlighted by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, announcing they selected next-generation AMD Epic CPUs and Radeon Instinct GPUs to power their El Capitan supercomputer, which is expected to deliver more than two exaflops of computing performance when it is deployed in early 2023. We are incredibly proud that two of the three publicly announced U.S. exascale supercomputing systems will exclusively use AMD CPUs and GPUs, clearly positioning AMD as the exascale computing leader based on our high-performance computing and graphics technologies and software capabilities. In closing, our long-term strategy and growth drivers remain unchanged. Although there are some near-term uncertainties in the demand environment, we are well positioned to navigate through this situation. We have a solid financial foundation and our product portfolio is very well positioned across the PC, gaming, and data center markets. While demand indicators across commercial, education, and data center infrastructure markets are strong, we expect some softness in consumer demand in the second half of the year, depending on how overall macroeconomic conditions evolve. We remain on track to launch our next generation Zen 3 CPUs and our DNA 2 GPUs in late 2020, and believe we can deliver another year of strong revenue growth and margin expansion based on the strength of our product portfolio and the diversity of markets we serve. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Devinder to provide some additional color on our first quarter financial performance. Devinder? Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. We performed well in the first quarter as we navigated a challenging environment as a result of the ongoing impact of COVID-19. First quarter revenue was $1.79 billion, up 40% from a year ago and down 16% from the prior quarter. Year-over-year -year growth was driven by strong sales of Ryzen and Epic processors and Radeon products, partially offset by lower semi-custom sales. Gross margin was 46%, up 490 basis points from a year ago, driven by Ryzen and Epic processor sales. Operating expenses were 584 million compared to 545 million a year ago, primarily due to increased investments in R&D and go-to-market activities. Operating income was 236 million, up 152 million from a year ago, driven by revenue growth and a greater percentage of Ryzen and Epic processor sales, while operating margin increased to 13% as compared to 7% a year ago. Net income was $222 million, up from $62 million a year ago, and diluted earnings per share was $0.18 cents per share compared to $0.06 cents per share a year ago. Now turning to the business segment results. Computing and graphics segment re revenue was $1.44 billion, up 73% year-over-year, driven by Ryzen processor and Radeon product channel sales growth. Computing and graphics segment operating income was $262 million, or 18% of revenue, compared to $16 million a year ago, driven by significantly higher revenue. Enterprise embedded and semi-custom segment revenue was $348 million, down 21% from 441 million the prior year due to the expected decline in semi-custom sales, partially offset by strong data center growth. EESC segment had a loss of 26 million compared to operating income of 68 million a year ago, which included the benefit of a 60 million licensing gain. Turning to the balance sheet, Cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities totaled $1.4 billion. 
In addition, in early April, we took the precautionary step to draw down 200 million from our 500 million revolving line of credit. Inventory was 1.1 billion, up 8% from the prior quarter. On a trailing 12-month basis, adjusted EBITDA was 1.2 billion, resulting in gross leverage of 0.5 times. Free cash flow was negative 120 million in the first quarter, an improvement of 155 million from the prior year. Cash flow from operations was negative 65 million, an improvement of 148 million from a year ago. Let me turn to the outlook for the second quarter of 2020. Today's outlook is based on current expectations and contemplates the current COVID-19 environment and customer demand signals. We expect revenue to be approximately 1.85 billion, plus or minus 100 million, an increase of approximately 21% year over year, and an increase of approximately 4% sequentially. The year over year increase is expected to be driven by strong growth in Ryzen and Epic processor sales. The sequential increase is driven primarily by Epic processor and semi-custom sales. In addition, for Q2 2020, we expect non-GAAP gross margin to be approximately 44% due to higher semi-custom revenue. Non-GAAP operating expenses to be approximately 600 million. Non-GAAP interest expense taxes and other to be approximately 20 million and the diluted share count in the second quarter is expected to be approximately 1.23 billion shares. For the full year 2020, despite expectations of weaker COVID-19 related consumer demand in the second half of the year, we expect annual revenue growth of approximately 25% plus or minus 5 percentage points. In addition, we expect non-GAAP gross margin to be approximately 45% unchanged from prior guidance and non-GAAP operating expenses to be approximately 29% of revenue. In closing, while the market environment has become more challenging given the impact of COVID-19, our first quarter results demonstrate the strength of our business model. Notwithstanding some near-term demand uncertainties, our long-term strategy is unchanged and we are well positioned with our competitive products and the strength of our balance sheet to navigate today's environment. As I finish, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our employees for their dedication, flexibility, and focus in these extraordinary times. With that, I'll turn it back to Ruth for the question and answer session. Ruth? Thank you, Devinder. Um, operator, if you could pull the audience for questions, please. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to be placed in the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing star 1. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question today is coming from Matt Ramsey from Cowan. Your line is now live. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hope everyone at AMD is doing well considering the uh, interesting times we live in. Um, Lisa, I, I wanted to start with a couple of questions on the server business. Um, I guess one of which is um, how do you the, the EESC results in the quarter that you just printed were a bit below at least where I had modeled them. So maybe you could talk a bit about how you feel the Epic business is tracking toward that sort of 10% target you guys had set for the second quarter. And, and I noticed in Devinder's comments on, on the June quarter guidance, most some of the upside is going to be driven, um, I guess upside sequentially is going to be driven by Epic. So how are you tracking against that? And then the last little piece is I keep getting uh, more and more questions still about the timing of Milan, and I know you guys reiterated that would be this year at the analyst day, and, and if that's still the case, um, just let us know. Thanks. 
Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Thank you, and um, appreciate the question. So, look, we are uh, very pleased with the progress in our server business. You know, I think if you look at um, sort of the progress we've made, there were a number of key things that uh, we wanted to see happen. Um, what we saw in the quarter that we just finished, in the first quarter, uh, we actually saw a, a very nice acceleration. Um, of the cloud business uh, as, uh, as we went through the quarter. Um, I think as we go into the second quarter, um, there's uh, an additional significant um, you know, ramp of the server business. And so uh, you know, we expect to uh, you know, continue to gain share as we go through um, these next couple of quarters. I think what we're seeing from the, um, the current you know, COVID-19 environment, obviously there's a lot of puts and takes, but as it relates to data center, it's positive uh, for the data center market. Um, you know, certainly we've seen um, some of our largest customers ask us to accelerate um, some of our deployments, and um, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing to ramp um, our server business. Um, I think you asked about Milan, and uh, yes, we are um, you know, expecting to, uh, to be uh, launching that at the end of this year. Got it, thank you. Um, just Wanted to switch quickly into the, the PC business. Um, one of the things that stood out to me from your commentary in the prepared script was the contrast between strength in, in the PC business globally versus the weakness in China. I imagine that weakness in China was both on the PC side on, and on the AIB graphics business. Um, if there's any way that you could help uh, quantify that, and, and we've heard some commentary about the, the economy restarting in China. Have you seen some of those trends start to improve into the second quarter. Thank you. Sure. So, um, you know, the PC business has um, actually uh, held up pretty well. So, if we look at, um, you know, the PC uh, business in the first quarter, uh, we saw um, the rest of the world PC business actually get some benefit, uh, you know, from some of the um, acceleration in demand sort of towards uh, the end of the quarter. Um, we did so see some weakness in China as um, China was shut down um, in you know, the months of February and early March. Uh, we saw that primarily in the channel business, so in offline channels. Um, now, we have seen that pick up as uh, we've gone through the month of April. Um, and what we're seeing in general in the PC business is, you know, the, the first quarter and the second quarter is actually relatively strong with um, accelerated notebook demand um, and, uh, you know, desktops, um, you know, sequentially lower uh, just based on, you know, sort of the preference around, um, you know, notebook versus desktop in this, um, in this framework. So those are the, the key dynamics for the PC business. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, please ask one question, one follow-up to return to the queue. Our next question is coming from Joe Moore from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now live. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you guys are one of the few companies kind of giving a full year guidance, and I just wonder if you could talk us through how you're thinking about the second half. You know, obviously you guys have OEM visibility into a bunch of new sockets and new designs, but your customers don't seem to have visibility. So what, just a little bit more color maybe on how you uh, are thinking about forecasting beyond the visibility that you have in Q2. Yeah, sure, Joe. So um, look, we, uh, you know, we understand that um, you know, there's uh, a lot of questions about uh, visibility as we go into uh, the second half of the year. You know, the way we look at our business is um, you know, we have sort of a lot of positives in terms of just market drivers that um, you know, we do have good visibility to. Um, I think our progress in the data center market is a positive. Um, you know, we see that with the number of platforms ramping and um, you know, the, the number of um, uh, customers that we have coming on board. So we see that as a positive uh, for us um, as we go through uh, this year. Um, you know, console gaming is a positive for us. Uh, there's lots of anticipation around um, the consoles. Um, it's you know, one of the largest launches, I think, of the year. Um, and you know, from that standpoint, there's no change in our view um, as it relates uh, to COVID-19, just given um, you know, what we see uh, today. Now, um, as you look at the range, you know, we have increased the range um, of our guide. And you know, sort of the biggest um, sort of question mark in my mind is you know, kind of the shape of the PC market this year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the first half actually looks you know, a little bit stronger than expected, particularly on the notebook side. Um, you know, we are um, potentially expecting some weakness in the second half uh, due to consumer spending. You sort of have the two 
uh, the, you know, the two forces are there. I mean, one is um, there is a pull with the strong work from home trends, but then there's also the view that um, from a macro standpoint, uh, you know, will be weaker in the second half of the year. So that's the primary variance um, in our model is, um, you know, what, what happens to the PC market. I will say, though, that underneath the market trends, um, we're very pleased with our portfolio. I mean, the, uh, the notebook portfolio that we have in uh, PCs is the strongest we've ever had. And uh, we, you know, we have a, a good opportunity to, uh, to gain share um, throughout the year, um, even as you know, the market may be a little bit weaker than um, originally expected. So um, that's the reason for the guidance, to try to give the, the puts and takes. And you know, of course, we'll see how, how the year plays out. That's helpful. Thank you. And then in terms of uh, data center GPU, I know you talked a lot about the analyst day, about the newer products and penetration of new workloads in the second half. Can you talk about you know, the workloads that you've been addressing so far, cloud gaming and whatnot, and you know, how, how is that business progressing before we get to the CDNA launch? Yeah, so the data center GPU business is an important strategic business. You know, in terms of size, it's um, still relatively small compared to the data center CPU business. Um, we are making progress, uh, good overall progress in um, a number of workloads. Cloud gaming is one that has been um, a good one for us, and uh, we continue to see opportunity in that um, as we go through this year. Um, with the current product set. Uh, we also just uh, launched the VDI instance with uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, which uh, you know, we feel will be a, a good workload for us. And then we have a number of the HPC wins that, um, that, we, uh, that we've talked about that are going to be based on the CDNA architecture, um, you know, which is an important strategic um, area for us, um, as well as you know, continued focus on you know, improving our machine learning and overall machine learning you know, frameworks and, and capabilities. So, so those are the key workloads that we're going after. And um, you know, I do think it's, a, it's an important business for us as we, uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is coming from Vivek Arya from Bank of America Securities. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, Lisa, for my first one, I just wanted to go back uh, to your Epic uh, server business. Uh, so very strong units in uh, Q1, but uh, it appears that the mix was very kind of cloud heavy, so perhaps ASPs uh, were uh, lower than we are used to uh, seeing. I was, I was wondering if you could just give us some sense of how we should think about uh, server ASPs going forward. And importantly, if you think of server sales for you for this year versus what you thought uh, 90 days ago, uh, how is that uh, looking like? Because I think your competitor said that they expected some kind of uh, digestion of cloud capacity in, in the back half. So I, I was just hoping to get some more color around ASP and just what you thought of your overall server business uh, for this year. Sure, Vivek. Um, yes, so the, that is correct. There was a, um, a mixed shift towards cloud um, in the first quarter, and uh, that did um, have an impact with ASPs lower. Um, that being the case, the ASPs are very healthy. So, um, I, you know, I think from the standpoint of how our business evolves, um, it's within, you know, the plus or minus of the business model. Um, in terms of where, uh, you know, we believe demand will be versus 90 days ago, it's, it's pretty similar. And the way I would say it is, um, you know, we see cloud being strong. Um, what we see is um, not just putting on more capacity, but really the ramping of new platforms. And, um, and so we view that as a positive. Uh, we have strong enterprise um, adoption as well. When we look at our pipeline in enterprise, um, it's continued to grow and um, continue to grow in the first quarter and continue to grow you know, in sort of the first month um, here of the second quarter. Um, we do expect uh, perhaps that the transactional business or the, the SMB type of business uh, may be more impacted by COVID-19, but that was never a large piece of our business uh, to begin with. Um, so we feel good about the server business, and you know, it continues to be a very strategic focus for us. Um, I think the relationships with our partners and our customers are getting closer. Um, as we go through, you know, sort of the the uh, um, the process of ramping of volumes, and um, and so we continue to view it as a, a strong growth driver uh, for us on a year-over-year -year basis. Very helpful. And then maybe a follow-up for uh, the vendor on uh, gross margins. Uh, so first half kind of tracking towards your 45-ish percent target uh, for the year, but Q2 is 44 percent. And I recall, um, I think. 
either Lisa or Devinder, you said that second half will be more semi-custom weighted, uh, but that suggests some more pressure on, on gross margins. So I was just hoping you could walk us through how we should think about gross margins in the back half, given all, all the puts and takes of a mix that uh, you are expecting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, Vivek. I think the key puts and takes is, as you said, continued ramp for the semi-custom, uh, which has margins, as you observe, lower than corporate average. But they are offset by the strength of the data center revenue. So semi-custom rent the back half, and that uh, does impact the gross margin being lower than corporate average. But data center strength, as Lisa just referenced, uh, uh, that we are pleased with the ramp in the in the data center business. And data center business, the margins are uh, significantly higher than corporate average, and that helps the offset uh, to help us deliver as we guided for 2020 the 45%. Um, uh, gross margin for 2020. Yeah, yeah maybe, uh, Vivek, I can just add to that. So sure. um, in addition to the data center uh, mix that uh, Devinder mentioned, um, we also expect to see the console uh, gross margins improve as we go through the year. And um, you know, that's the uh, reason for the full year guide at, uh, at 45%. So usually what happens is in the uh, very you know, the second quarter is our very first quarter of ramp um, for uh, the consoles. And so the margin um, starts a little bit lower and, and continues to ramp as we go through the year. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Mark Lapesis from Jeffries. Your line is now live. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, on the uh, first question on the client side, I, I guess AMD has historically uh, had a, a, a good presence on the uh, consumer side, but it sounds like you're making great progress on the commercial side with the HP and, and ThinkPad design wins. Can you give us a sense roughly, like what is the split between consumer and commercial on the notebook side? and like how is, how does that play going forward? Does commercial just continue to grow faster than the consumer side, and is there an impact on the gross margin between um, if, if commercial does grow faster? That's the first question. Thanks. Uh, yes, Mark. So um, our PC business does tend to be uh, much more consumer weighted. I mean, we've made progress in commercial. You know, commercial has grown nicely, but um, it's still um, you know consumer weighted. Um, we expect to continue to gain a commercial share as we go through this year. Um, as that happens, I think there's there's two things in the in the um, the PC margins that uh, um, that affect PC gross margins. You know, um, heavier weight of commercial um, is certainly positive um, for the overall gross margins. Um, I think the other piece is um, we should expect that education will be strong, and um, that tends to be um, you know lower in the mix. And so you know there there are lots of mixed dynamics, but overall. I think our um, confidence level in notebooks uh, being a strong growth driver for us um, as we go th through this year is good, and um, you know we continue to work on the you know com commercial versus consumer mix. Great, that's helpful. And then on the server side, um, uh, if you look at cloud instances versus cloud internal versus cl uh, versus enterprise versus HPC. Uh, can you give us a sense of the, the, the split today, if, if not by percentage, and like a rank order, and what you would expect to drive uh, going forward? Our own, our own field work had indicated that your instances were uh, growing nicely on Epic 2. Uh, I wonder to what extent is that being deployed internally on the cloud, uh, guys, also. Uh, thank you. Uh, sure, Mark. So when you look at um our cloud instances, I would say that um, our cloud, some of the cloud acceleration I referred to was acceleration of internal workloads at um, some of our top cloud customers. So I think that is, that, that's an area actually where we get more visibility. Um, you know, cloud instances in terms of numbers for, uh, uh, for external uh, usage um, has grown. You know, we announced the GCP platform, we announced the IBM platform. Um, as well as additional um, you know, Microsoft platforms. You will see more cloud instances uh, roll out um, over um, you know, the next um, you know, quarter or so. Um, but uh, the, much of the growth that we've seen has been around uh, internal deployment um, of, uh, of um, the cloud uh, companies. Um, and then as it relates to enterprise, um, it is more heavily weighted towards HPC. Uh, we've done very, very well in HPC. 
Um, we're pretty um, excited about our new high-frequency SKUs that were just launched here in April. Um, they're actually very well suited for um, large enterprise applications and um, you know, financial sector, um, as well as some of the technology sectors. And, uh, and so that's, that's a key focus for us in terms of growing those other pieces of the enterprise business. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Stacey Rasgon from Bernstein Research. Your line is now live. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, first, to uh, harp a little bit again on, on the server business, I guess I don't quite understand why a big shift toward cloud mix would drive ASPs down sequentially. I mean, your mix has been mostly cloud all along, so why all of a sudden is that driving ASPs down? And you know, I know you said units were up double digits. I guess in that context, what did revenues do sequentially? And maybe what were data center revenues, CPU plus GPU, um, as a percentage total in the quarter? Like if you could give any color on any of that, that would be really helpful. Sure. So um, we, we did have a positive cloud mix, but I would say that you know, the, the Q4 to Q1 mix uh, had significant um, improvement in cloud or significant uh, um, growth in cloud. So that was the uh, ASP you know, sort of shift that we talked about. Um, as it relates to data center overall, uh, we were in the high teens uh, this quarter. And you had one other question, Stacy. I, I said, did, what, what did revenues do sequentially? Oh, oh yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Revenue. So revenues were also up sequentially. Okay. Not as much as units, but Got revenues it. were sequentially. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Um, for my follow-up, um, again, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the um, the share target. So I know you'd said 10% um, share give or take by the middle of this year. You know, if I just if I even just take your entire EESC revenue and I take Intel's data center revenue this quarter, you'd be about five percent um, revenue share. Um, and I, you know, I know you're guiding for growth next quarter, but I mean, just given the magnitudes, it doesn't feel like that's going to double in a quarter. So, just how are you feeling about that ten percent guide um, for the middle of this year? Is that getting pushed out? Are we defining it wrong? Like, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, so the way we uh, define the, um, the share target, and you know, it very much is uh, sort of the, the view of we expect about 20 million units a year in terms of um, single socket and dual socket servers. Um, that's about 5 million units a quarter, so 10% share is about you know, half a million units. Um, from where you know, we look today, uh, we look to be on track to that. Um, Q2 is actually by, by our... Q2? Yes, yes. Q2 is actually our strongest backlog uh, quarter, um, you know that we've seen. So, you know, I think that's that's our current visibility today. But is, is that 20 million an appropriate number, though, given you're now playing in com, whereas maybe when you gave that target before, you weren't playing in com? Isn't the total target at the total market more like 30 million or even more, right? Well, again, I think um, not to uh, not to go back on on how we define the target. I think I, I've given you how we define the target. And um, I think that's an appropriate way to define the target. I think our, um, our comms uh, exposure is very, very early, and um, I would say is not a significant part of uh, the revenue at this point. Got it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is coming from Toshio Hari from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now live. Hi, uh, thank you so much for taking the question. Uh, Lisa, I wanted to go back to your full year guide. Um, I appreciate there's a wide range of outcomes here, and um, you know you did put up a, a, an updated number. But um, if, if we take the if we take the midpoint of your updated guidance and we compare and contrast that with your old guidance, you are lowering the midpoint of your revenue um, outlook by about 250 million, maybe a little bit more. Um, in response to Joe's question, I think you focused very much on the notebook business. Is that sort of the primary um, part of your business where you're lowering numbers, or is it uh, a little bit more broad-based across GPU and, and perhaps the game console business as well? Yeah, um, so I, I would say from the full year standpoint, um, the biggest variable is the PC business in its entirety. So that's notebook and desktop. Um, and you know, like I said, it's a variable. Um, if I, you know, you can model various um, scenarios as to what it can be, and I think from our standpoint, when we started the year, um, we had the expectation of a pretty normal PC environment. Um, I think we would all say that uh, the environment is um, is different than when we started, and given the size of that market, we have, um, you know, given ourselves a wide range. Um, as it relates to what we thought before, it's primarily PCs. 
Um, and when you look at the other markets, you know, game consoles, data center, um, were about um, what we expected, and you know, the, uh, the signals continue to be positive in those areas. Great. And, and by and the way, I should, follow uh, I'm sorry, if I can just finish off. I, on PCs, I, I would say, though, that um, I think we're all waiting to see some of the data as we go through uh, the second half of the year. So um, you know, I want to say that, um, like I said, there's those two competing forces. One is um, there's a strong pull for um, work from home trends, and the other is just you know, what is the impact on macro going to be uh, for discretionary consumer spend. And so I think that's the place where uh, we, we lack you know, full visibility, and you know, we continue to talk to our customers, and I think we're all you know, trying to make sure that we are well prepared for um, any of the scenarios as they come about. I appreciate that. And as a quick follow-up, um, Lisa, I wanted to ask about the competitive landscape. Um, your nearest competitor, uh, you know, continues to, to grow wafer capacity, um, as, as you know, and they talked quite a bit about accelerating um, the, the RAM for 10 uh, last week on their call. Um, are, are you seeing any changes in how they compete in the marketplace, either from a pricing perspective or from a marketing dollar perspective, um, relative to, to how you saw the market 90 days ago? Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's the PC market is always a competitive market, and um, you know, from that standpoint, I don't think the environment has changed um, substantially from a uh, um, you know either a capacity standpoint or a marketing dollar standpoint. You know, from our view, you know, it's all about um, ensuring that the platforms that uh, that we um, you know, launch actually uh, ramp into production smoothly, and so you know we've been working on that, and you know we feel very good about that. I think you know we mentioned that we have a significant number of platforms, over 135 mobile platforms that are coming to market uh, here in uh, 2020, and um, you know they're very very competitive. They're some of our best platforms um, from a uh, from just an overall performance and capability standpoint. So you know we're bullish on our ability. Uh, to, um, to turn that into revenue growth. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Ross Seymour from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now live. Hi, thanks for letting me ask a question. Lisa, uh, not to kind of uh, go back to the same well as everybody else, but I wanted to hit on the epic side of things. I guess the good news is you guys are growing very rapidly and taking share, and you reiterated that 10% uh, market share goal for the June quarter. But overall, it seems like the number has not really upsided anybody's expectations over the last few quarters, despite the market accelerating from a demand perspective, your primary competitor upsiding their data center group, or even their cloud segment within that for three to four quarters in a row. So I just wanted to, to get your feeling on, is there something that is capping the growth there? Is it the ASPs going down because of who the customers are? Uh, I'm just wondering why if the market is as strong as it has seemed to be for the last three or four quarters, you're doing really well, but not actually upsiding our expectations. Yeah, Ross, the way I look at it, and I mean, this was very, very similar to the ramp that we saw in the PC business. You know, the, um, the ramp in server is, is something like steady as she goes. And um, you know, each quarter we add platforms. Each quarter more platforms are qualified. Each quarter, um, you know, they ramp. It's a little bit different from a pure market phenomena. And again, I mean, I, I understand that um, there are market phenomena, and then there are um, you know growth expectations based on you know platform launches, um, as well as um, you know uh, software being qualified and so on and so forth. So as it relates to our expectations is actually going quite well. Um, as it relates to um, you know, the um, you know, acceleration of cloud, I think we're pleased with it. You know, we're not ready to upside numbers at this point. I think we want, you know, we already had very aggressive growth assumptions um, in, uh, in what we went through. I think you'll see us um, a little bit less uh, market specific and a little bit more um, AMD specific as it relates to our customers and you know, their qualification plans. So, you know, I think we are um, confident that um, our data center business is doing well, and you know, we need to continue to demonstrate that over a number of quarters. Thanks for that answer. You're just for my follow-up, one to switch gears over to the computing and graphics side. Could you just give a little bit of color of what you expect for that in the second quarter? And then, as you look into the second half, I know you mentioned that's the area of greatest uncertainty for uh, many logical reasons. 
But any sort of difference between the computing and the graphic side, both in your second quarter expectations and then the puts and takes in the back half of the year? Yeah, so uh, we are expecting that the computing and graphics business will be down sequentially. So um, it's offsetting some of the growth on the, um, on the Epic and semi-custom side. Um, within the computing and graphics business, um, you know, we see notebooks up strongly. Um, as a result of uh, the launch of our new Ryzen 4000 platforms and some of the other um, trends that we've talked about, uh, we see desktop down sequentially and we see graphics down sequentially. Um, Q2 is normally a sequentially down quarter for the channel business um, for us, so that's not unusual. And um, you know, we, that's, those are the dynamics in the second quarter. And as we go through the second half of the year, as I mentioned, um, you know, we'll have to see how you know, consumer spending holds up against um, the other demand environments. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from John Pitzer from Credit Suisse. Your line is now live. Yeah, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for letting me ask the question. Lisa, just my first question. I wonder if you could just help me kind of better understand in this current environment of shelter in place, how does that impact sort of new customer, new workload engagement? And, and I guess to, to, to better kind of underscore that, just given that you're expecting pretty good share gains in the back half of the year, given your second half guidance, notwithstanding the gaming cycle, are most of those wins already in your back pocket and so you've got high visibility? Or how do I think about that dynamic? Yeah, so I think there, um, there are many that are already in progress, and um, that would be our you know, sort of, you know, our typical view of how long it takes to ramp a customer from beginning of engagement to uh, to actual, you know, ramp. Can it be anywhere from, you know, six to nine months um, if um, if that's a, that's a good number? Um, as it relates to, uh, you know, what we see with the, as you call it, shelter in place, look, we see pretty strong activity. I mean, you know, the activity um, con level continues to be high. Um, on both the cloud um, as well as the enterprise side. You know, the only place where you know, perhaps we see a little bit of uh, a slowdown is, as I said, on some of the transactional business, um, which uh, you know, we had a plan to grow as we go through this year, and that, that, might, uh, that might grow more slowly, um, you know, just as people aren't focused on, on new infrastructure right now. But in terms of um, cloud and, and large enterprise, um, you know, there continues to be, you know, good um, activity on both, um, you know, current already won uh, design platforms as well as, you know, new pipeline engagements. That's helpful, Lisa. As, as my follow-up, as you guys are painfully aware, one of the metrics that, that we probably focus probably too much on is just gross margin and gross margin progression. and. You know, given the, the gaming sort of ramp coming, it sort of convolutes the issue. So I, I was kind of hoping maybe you would quantify both in your Q2 guide and your full year guide, what, what impact, you know, the, the gaming console business is having on gross margins, i.e., what would gross margins be trending to right now, X gaming for both June and the full year? Yeah, I think if you, if you look at it, John. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so if you look at Q2, if the, if you're asking the specific Q1 to Q2, you know Q2 we came in at the 46%. Q2 is down, and fundamentally, primarily, is due to the ramp in the game console revenue. As Lisa said earlier, you know we mentioned that the margins in the initial ramp of semi-custom revenue are typically lower, and they do improve over time for semi-custom, but also from a company standpoint, when you look at the Corporate average gross margin is lower, and therefore uh, it is having an impact in terms of sequentially uh, the margin is going down from Q1 to Q2. And but I, I guess, Mr. Bender, my, my question is: Is the non-gaming mar gross margins continuing to move higher sequentially every quarter this year? And, and i.e., is it more than 100 basis point impact from gaming in the June quarter? I, I think. Uh, I, uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, we're, Devinder and I are not in the same room, so. Um, <laughs> uh, the answer is yes, John. The impact of the, the sequential decline of, of two points is, um, is semi-custom. If you take semi-custom out, the rest of the portfolio um, would be, uh, what you would see in the rest of the portfolio is you would see server up, and um, you would see, um, you know, desktop offsets some of that, but the uh, sequential decline is is all semi-custom. 
Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Timothy R. Curry from UBS. Your line is now live. Hi. Um, I had two. I guess the first question, Devinder, I think you said that um, data center was uh, you know, high teens of revenue, so that would put it sort of in the low to mid threes for March. Um, can you break out how much was CPU versus GPU? And I guess on the GPU side, that can be pretty lumpy. So uh, anything to call out that's assumed for June? Yeah, it's weighted towards the CPUs. If you take the data center CPUs and GPUs together, the revenue in Q1 is high teens uh, of revenue in Q1, uh, but primarily weighted towards the CPUs uh, because that's the area of growth from a, a server CPU business standpoint. Okay, uh, and then I guess um, your bigger picture question. So Lisa, I, I, I think there's some new um, regulations in China that go into effect on you know, June 1st around uh, additional cybersecurity review for you know, critical information infrastructure. And I, I would think that maybe you could fall under that. So any thought on how that could impact demand for you and maybe if you could sort of tell us how much of your revenue on a consumption basis you think right now is in China, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we're looking at that new regulation. Um, so I, I don't have any you know, specifics at this point in time. We'll continue to look at that, um, that new regulation. You know, as it relates overall, I would say you know, the majority of our business in China is um, you know, consumer or let's call it um, you know, consumer-related cloud. Excellent, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, operator, operator, we'll take two more questions, please. Certainly, our next question is coming from Mitch Steves from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I've got one to follow up. But the first one, just kind of on the bookings you guys are saying. So I'm less worried about kind of the near-term revenue number you guys put up per server. But if you're sitting here today and you compare that to a quarter ago, um, what, what do the bookings look like or backlog? Has that changed at all? Is that improving? Is it getting better? Or is it pretty much in line with what you guys expected in terms of the overall uh, backlog? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think I said earlier, but Mitch, it is certainly better. So we have, you know, better visibility um, a month into the quarter versus, you know, 90 days ago. Okay, and then the second one I had is just more broad. It's, it's on China, actually. Um, so one thing we're picking up is that a lot of the Chinese companies are supposedly uh, buying a lot of semiconductor chips ahead just in case they get banned from the U.S. and China relationship uh, deterioration. So since you guys are not really involved in that, you're more exposed to the hyperscale, um, do you guys have any comments on what you guys think is actually happening there if people are actually trying to build up, um, I guess, build up an inventory level for semiconductor chips that they may get banned? Or do you think that's kind of just noise and it's not really occurring right now in, the, in that geography? Yeah, Mitch, it's a little bit hard for me to generalize. Um, I would say from what we see, and you know we track uh, both sell-in and consumption pretty pretty closely. You know it it looks like it's it's normal patterns, but um, you know we we don't have exposure to some of the markets you're talking about. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Blaine Curtis from Barclays. Your line is now live. Hey, thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, maybe Lisa, just looking at the fiscal guide. Um, you know, I'm kind of curious, if you look at first half or second half, it seems like you still would require growth in computing graphics. I want to just make sure that was right. And then I'm just kind of curious how you think of the server. Obviously, you're a share gainer. Um, you know, I think cloud and enterprise get intermingled together, particularly with this work from home. So I'm kind of just kind of curious as you look at that business, first half and second half, do you, I think Intel was talking about some weakness in enterprise and government. It's not a big exposure for you, but I'm just kind of curious how you're thinking about it. Is there any headwind? as that work from home spend holds off the server as well. Yeah, so um, as it relates to, you know, first half, second half, I mean, as, as we said, there's a, you know, the, the 8.4 billion plus or minus 5% uh, is, a, is a wider than normal range for us. Um, I think you can see outcomes within that range that would have computing and graphics um, up, um, as well as you can see outcomes with it, um, you know, more flattish. Uh, so uh, that, that being the case, so I, I think the, the trends that I talked about are, are likely the right trends, which is um, you know, the uh, consumer spending uh, perhaps um, a little softer, um, enterprise and commercial a positive for us, notebook share gain a positive for us, 
And um, we want to see how, you know, sort of the desktop channel uh, behaves um, as we go into uh, the second half of the year. Um, and then your second question? Just kind of as you look at the server business, first half, second half, uh, you know, you had seen some, you saw some strength in cloud in, in, in March and June. I'm kind of curious, are you thinking about, is there any work from home benefits within that that would then turn into a headwind in the second half? Yeah, look, I think from what we see, um, we see uh, mostly platforms ramping. And um, and so that's that's how we're thinking about the data center business. Um, you know, of course, you know we're in this COVID nineteen environment, and so you know we'll have to actually play out the next couple of quarters. Uh, but within the ranges that we see, we see um, an opportunity to uh, continue growing um, in the second half of the year, given the visibility that we have with customers, the platforms that are ramping. Um, and um, you know, I still feel very much like we're in the early stages of our second gen epic ramp. And I know it's been a couple quarters, but that's just the way servers ramp. So uh, we're in the early stages of the ramp, um, lots of customer activity, um, significant pull um, you know, from the customers to get um, up and running um, as soon as possible. And um, you know, as you said, we don't have as much exposure to some of the, uh, the other end markets, which, uh, which may um, have uh, have more volatility in the second half of the year. Thanks. Thank you. We reached the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over for any further closing comments. Thank you, um, Kevin. That concludes today's call. We appreciate everybody participating. Um, stay safe, stay well, and we we'll look forward to engaging with you throughout the quarter. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference. You may disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful day.